relations building up from the Narendra Modi government and the upcoming budget clearly will be the first key policy document that will give a sense of the kind of reforms this government plans to unveil over the next few months to revive growth and reboot India. Hello and welcome to Budget Adda. I'm Shweta Rajpal Kohli. On the show today, we're focusing on the infrastructure and energy space, which clearly is one of Mr. Modi's top priorities. So what can the finance minister do on the 10th of July to give infrastructure the much-needed boost. With me on the show today, the who's who as far as this sector is concerned, uh, Mr. Vinayak Chatterjee, Chairman of uh, Feedback Infrastructure Private Limited, uh, GV Sanjay Reddy, Vice Chairman of GVK Power and Infrastructure Limited, and Suman Sinha, Chairman of Renew Power. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for being with us here on the show. Let me start by actually trying to get a sense of what Mr. Modi's infrastructure priorities really are. And he's outlined quite a few over the past few weeks. Uh, roads, high-speed train networks, more airports, 24-hour uh, electricity supply, rural housing, toilets, special manufacturing zones, 100 new cities, interbasin river transfers. So it's a long wish list out there. How much of it can be implemented and what should be his main key priority? What are the challenges? Let me start, Mr. Chatterjee, by actually trying to understand from you, how has the start been, especially as far as infrastructure is concerned? You've been talking about infrastructure really being the key to India's growth over the past so many years. Do you think the Modi government has at least started off for this particular priority rather well? No question. I think the start has been <clears throat> very energetic. Uh, I would also say that we are getting a lot of out-of-the-box thinking. Okay. For example, Mr. Gadkari's announcement of having a 1 lakh crore road fund based on toll securitization and Japanese participation uh, would certainly allow him financially to achieve his stated target of 30 kilometers a day starting year 3. But so we've a lot of out of the box things happened before 30 kilometers a day 25 kilometers a day the previous government and it's it's in fact not a not so famous figure but do you think it's achievable and what makes it different what makes it different is that we're looking at a completely different format to achieving the end objective of having better roads so the fact that this plan is backed by a credible innovative financial structure is what gives it its credibility so i fully endorse it and to answer your point i think the government has got off to a very energetic uh, start across many of these dimensions. And whatever you've heard Mr. Modi really talk about, Mr. Reddy, over the past few weeks, he, he does understand that infrastructure is absolutely critical to India's growth. Absolutely. I think Mr. Modi, as we know, is a visionary. And he set the vision very clearly for everyone, especially his ministers and his government. And one more thing which is very interesting is that there are only four people, three to four people, who are pretty much running the entire infrastructure space right. and where he's merged ministries. Right. And even within this short period, the kind of energy, the enthusiasm, the amount of time they've spent and the understanding they have of the issues and their ability to find resolutions and start making announcements is nothing short of outstanding. Merging ministries is clearly something that we've heard captains of industry talk about in the past. But when it comes to working on the ground, how much will it help before we move on to really talking about key budget expectations, Saman? I think it will help a lot, Shweta. For example, you know, our minister now is Piyush Goel. He's responsible for coal and power and renewable energy. Right. Now, there are interfaces between, uh, you know, two of these ministries at a time for sure. For example, coal, the primary customer of coal is the power ministry, right? There are lots of log jam issues between those. Similarly, the renewable energy industry uses primarily the power infrastructure which comes under the power ministry. So there were lots of interface and pain points between those ministries as well. And so by giving, for example, just one single minister charge of all three ministries, I think it creates or it makes for a much better coordination between those ministries. And somebody can now take a holistic view. And I think that is really what we're beginning to see. And so therefore now uh, Piyush Goel has the opportunity of really coming up with a, with a much more integrated thought process about looking at the entire energy or the Space, power requirement. Right. Uh, and so I think it, this makes a lot of sense. Certainly. Okay, let's talk budget now because clearly that's the one major announcement everybody is looking forward to. But as you mentioned, there's hardly been any time this government has been in power. And that's why if you actually set your expectations too high, you are also worried about setting yourself up against disappointment. Is it unrealistic to expect Mr. Jaitley to do a lot in this budget? You know, since this is a discussion on infrastructure, I just want to share with your viewers that the budget has certain limitations. For right. example, I did some quick maths, and it's easy to find out that on the 12th plan annual target, 
the budget can actually fund from the consolidated fund of india only about 14 or 15 percent of the total infrastructure plan as announced by the planning commission so now therefore you have to temper your expectations that the budget cannot solve india's infrastructure problems the budget is certainly responsible for 15 or 20 percent of the expenditure but it has the important point of giving signals and messages to the balance funders and signals, uh, to and do this, signals to do is absolutely same. something that everybody is looking for so you've got on got off to a very good start but now we're looking for key policy changes or at least the direction the broader reforms is that correct yeah i think look what the government has done is they sort of run a fairly tight ship in the first one month ministers right. have been working hard they've been working with the bureaucrats uh, right from the morning till night I think there's a certain discipline that has come into the working of, of government in general. And I know that the, a lot of presentations are being made to the Prime Minister, you know, secretaries are getting together. And so I think behind all of that, there's a lot of learning, as, as Sanjay said earlier, a lot of learning is going on. But also I think because a lot of these ministers are coming with a new perspective, that is allowing them to just ask the very basic commonsensical questions. And therefore also come up hopefully with new solutions, uh, which are out of the box. And I think which we'll start seeing the implementation of over the next few months' time. The budget may or may not capture some of these ideas, but certainly, as Vinayak said, I think the intent can certainly be reflected in the budget, if right. not the actual implementation of ideas themselves, which perhaps can follow as we go forward. May I, may I make a quick sure. point, sure. just to add to what Suman said? You know, what I found personally very happy reading the newspapers, and other than the structured silos of egoms and goms, I find the current crop of ministers very happily talking to each other and solving problems. Which was clearly not the case in, in, yeah, in the UPA government. And, and, yeah. and that's evident every day when you yeah. read the news. And that, I think, is a very, very happy development. They're partners of progress together and they're saying, look, i got a problem with your ministry, let's sort it out. Okay, and will that help actually yeah. solve the big infrastructure problem, which is actually of projects being, being stalled? And to look at the numbers, we've got 20 lakh crore around uh, or that number of the kind of worth of projects that are actually stalled right now. So perhaps uh, the critical bit will be hastening those project approvals, implementing some of those stall projects, also perhaps identifying about a hundred must-do infrastructure projects. Uh, can the government really do that? It's a tight agenda forward. Mr. Reddy, uh, you were talking to me a little while earlier about some of the regulatory issues that you really face. And, and as Mr. Chatterjee said, in the past uh, we talked about in many times environmental clearances, fuel linkages, land acquisition, and many of these uh, problems also coming because because ministers were not talking to each other. We were seeing one minister was giving a go-ahead, clearing a file. It was being stalled at another ministry. Do you think now the government needs to put in place a mechanism where we don't see any regulatory issues like the ones we faced in the past? I think regulatory issues are on two fronts. One is, of course, relating to land, environment, and various other government approvals that are required. And from whatever I understand from people that I've been talking to, I think the Prime Minister's message is very clear. Don't push up your problems to me. You guys sort out your problems. Right. And I think it's quite clear with what, as Vinayak was saying, that people are sitting together, they're sorting out issues, they're coming up with policies and implementing them. And I think that is something which we will see more and more going forward is what my expectation is. Second is in terms of uh, things like tariff, which is what I think the general public is more, uh, uh, you know, will get impacted by whether it's in toll roads, whether it's in airports, whether it's power pricing, etc. Those are things which are much more complicated and that's where also I think the government needs to bring about a lot of clarity. So we, we talked about tariffs and the other of course a big item will be power and getting the whole power space right and that comes as part of the larger infrastructure energy issue. Now we've seen uh, him talk a lot about unlocking the coal potential and it's really an irony that we face in India right now the fact that India continues to be to have the largest fifth largest coal reserves uh, but uh, continues to be the world's third largest importer of coal now solving the coal issue price pooling is something we've been talking about focus on renewable energies the whole power energy space is something where we expect uh, a lot to happen over the next few months no I totally agree with you Shweta and I think that uh uh, I think Piyush is going to look at it not with the, the normal sort of eyes that we look at in the sense of there's a coal problem, so let's give coal mining in a different manner or something like that. So I think he's going to look at it from the point of view of trying to come up with solutions that are perhaps more driven from the distribution side. Right. One of the critical problems that we have is that uh, you know, we have huge losses on the distribution side. The whole area, 80-90% of it is controlled by state-owned companies. How can we reform that side? Perhaps there's a lot of hidden 
Jews that are sitting there. And so I think what he's going to try to look at is to find, try to find solutions that do not necessarily mean a hike of tariffs to the end customers. So I think sure. that's where some of the effort is going to be. And I think he's also going to focus on some of the issues around grid infrastructure. So I let's mean, see, let's see, yeah, let's see what happens on that. Let's talk tariffs because it's yeah. important you brought up that point because that's something that impacts end consumers. You know, everybody talked about Ache Din and then at the end of the day, this government comes and increases rail tariffs. Now, that's also the bitter truth that Mr. Modi has talked about, the fact that there will be those unpopular decisions that he will have to take. And, and, and have they been able to drive home that message rather well? I think the budget will be very important as far as getting that message across. I think everyone understands the pain that uh, the Indian economy is going through in the last few years. So first, we have to, if I may say so, get out of the ICU and get to the bed. And then we can get out of the hospital. So we are, India has gone through a lot of challenges. So I think it's very important that we fix those problems, how much ever painful it is. And uh, I think it will take a couple of years. But at the same time, what the important thing is setting the expectations, saying this is the direction we are going in, this is the vision. Right. And as long as people know that there are better days to come, people don't mind going through the pain. And that's why of I think... higher tariffs, whether it is in the, in the power sector, whether it is and railways... If you get, if you get, a, if you, get uh, you know, uh, 24 by 7 power, people don't mind paying. Uh, it's a question of whether you, you don't get good, you don't get consistent power, you don't get quality power, and that's the challenge. Why should we pay for something which is not so? All right, I'm going to slip into a quick break at this point, but on the other side of the break, we'll tell our three guests to identify three points each, three things that they would like to hear in Arun Jaitley's speech on the 10th of July. Don't go away. Welcome back. You're watching Budget Adda and we're discussing what we can see as far as the infrastructure space is concerned in the upcoming budget. We're going to get our guests to actually identify some top priorities as well as some things that they would like to hear in Arun Jaitley's speech. Let me start with you, Mr. Chatterjee. The one thing that you want him to announce. Well, the one thing that the infrastructure sector is collectively looking forward to is to remove the incidence of MAT, which is called, the, you know, which is the minimum, minimum alternate, alternate tax, tax. Uh, which is superimposed on a 10-year tax holiday. Now, we think this is both illogical and irrational uh, to give a sector for national development a 10-year tax holiday and, and in the impose... middle of it, say, pay 21% MAT. So but like whenever, whenever we hear industry come and tell the government, you know what, remove this, tax concessions, you also need to realize that this is a time when the government needs to go ahead with fiscal consolidation. They need those revenues. Boosting revenues is perhaps the larger, bigger goal for the government. So is it fair for the industry to put this kind of pressure well, on the government? Well, this 10-year tax holiday was offered by the government themselves because they realized that in 30-year concession periods or 60-year concession period, the first 10 years of an infrastructure project are pretty stressful right. on cash. Right. And therefore, they, they themselves offered a 10-year tax holiday, which was welcomed. And people based their plans and projects on that. To suddenly impose a 21% mat on it seems illogical. So you're saying irrational. there's tax irrationality there? Yes. And that's something that needs to be removed yeah. And, yeah. and settled because there's no point of the 10-year tax holiday if you have... Yeah, a, I'm adding another word. I'm saying illogical also. Okay, illogical and <laughs> irrational as far as tax. <laughs> Mr. Reddy, your thoughts on, on the one thing you want to hear? I think one thing I want uh, the finance ministers to focus on is financing. Uh, infrastructure is the engine of growth for the economy, so unless you kickstart that, the country and the economy is not going to move. And it's expected in the next five years that about a trillion dollars of investment needs to go into infrastructure. At Where does that money come from? Where does the money come from? And they say that at least 50% has to come from private sector. If you take the equity and debt that is required, maybe about $350 billion of debt and $150 billion of equity. Talking about debt, I think we need to learn as to how other, other economies are financing infrastructure. A lot of that financing happens through bonds and tax-free bonds. Today, the government has been doing a bit of bonds for only some PSUs, uh, PSU banks like uh, right. uh, PFC and others. But we hope that the government will let all companies uh, uh, go to the market to raise tax-free bonds, which will make the cost of financing much cheaper and also uh, more reasonable in terms of tariffs. The second area is equity. Sure. Equity is the biggest challenge, if you ask me. If you ask me, one single challenge for the future of infrastructure in this country is equity, or the lack of it. Uh, you know, we need nearly 100 billion plus of equity, which is not available with Indian companies. So I would urge the government to seriously think about setting up a national fund uh, of maybe 10 to 20 billion dollars of equity fund. Which will be focused invest, on, on, be focused on, on just investing in infrastructure equity. Because today we are dependent purely 100% on foreign sources of equity. You take a forex risk and no foreign investor is willing to put equity. They're willing to put what is called a structured product, which is like in between equity and debt. 
and so they take all the upside, but the downside, the local company has to take. So what about airports? You've not mentioned anything specific with regard to airports because he's talked about that. He's talked about 100 new cities. So in, in, term, in terms of anything specific, any announcements you can expect in the budget per se? As far as can airports we... are concerned, you know, aviation industry itself is a phenomenal opportunity for this country as far right. as connectivity is concerned. So therefore, not only the larger metro cities, but non-metro non cities in terms of you know, privatizing some of those, but also the government uh, has to look at uh, budget uh, airports in smaller towns and cities. And so a whole program has to be worked out, and I know the government is thinking on those lines. So that would be critical, especially if you're talking about smart cities. You can't have a city without connectivity. So automatically it would mean that it would be close to, or you need to have small airports around these smart cities. So airports is a key area of focus, uh, which I think the government will certainly I hope uh, consider. And for an energy starved country like India, clearly renewable energy is a big focus a month, and that's an area that you work in very closely. Do you expect certain announcements in the budget in that space? Yeah, we do. Right? We are hopeful. You know, I think Mr. Modi has been very proactive on, on pushing renewable energy sources in Gujarat earlier. I think he's very comfortable, he's very familiar. He has a fairly grand vision of how solar can be used across canal tops. Uh, he's even talking about solar roads charge cars that are going on the roads, you know. So he's got, he's got a very sort of far into the future vision of what can be done. And keep in mind one thing, that because we're looking to kickstart the economy and the investment cycle, renewable energy projects have fairly sm small gestation periods. So within a fairly short period of time, you can actually get billions of dollars actually invested fairly fast. And that can actually give a uh, fillip to the manufacturing side as well as on the ground in terms of actual job creation and so on. Right Anything now. you don't want to hear in the speech? <laughs> Anything that comes to your mind, something that would really bother the industry? You know, a very high, you know, the industry's expectation is, is certainly, and the world at large also, is a containment of the fiscal deficit. Right. So I think one of the things we are looking forward to hearing is, even though unpopular, a certain strong discipline in managing the fisc in a situation in the first year when you're not going to get too much GDP revenue growth. So social sector schemes and subsidies, uh, if we don't see a strong attack on them, we right. may be disappointed. Okay, so you're saying that we, we want him to go ahead and say that, yes, the government plans to trim subsidies, uh, but those are, again, as we say, unpopular decisions. Would the government like to go ahead and take some of those unpopular decisions? Because the budget is also a time for the government to say, you know what, thank you. Thank you for giving us the strongest mandate in 30 years. Yeah, but you know, Shweta, if they don't use this opportunity now, when they have such a huge mandate, also keep in mind that Mr. Modi's entire plank during the election campaign was around development. Right. Now, if he doesn't deliver development, uh, either in the short term or the, or the visibility of it in the medium or the long term, then there is going to be a lot of disappointment. And, and as you note, observed in the beginning, expectations are sky high right now. Uh, capital markets have already run up. You know, corporates like all of us are certainly expecting good things out of this budget. And even if, you know, specific things don't get announced now, you know, given the way in which the government is working, we certainly do expect a long-term roadmap to be presented in the budget, which is in the direction of fiscal prudence, which is in the direction of uh, making sure that certain policies are announced and certain confidence is given to foreign investors to address Sanjay's point around can, uh, capital can, can issues. I, you know, the, as Suman said, the thrust of the election was to change the Indian state from one of entitlement to one of empowerment. Right. So when you, when you push that needle, withdrawal of entitlements is unpopular equal to removal of subsidies and social sector schemes. Right. So the time is now to bite that bullet, and we are watching. Yeah. I think we have to also keep in mind that people are much more intelligent than what uh, we think they are. Yes, they are going to make some noise, as long as those are reasonable, and they are not unreasonable. And people we saw what understand. happened with rail, rail fares, for instance. There's, people, there's some, people digested it at the They end. digested it, there are some people, and of course, leaving aside the political rhetoric, if you keep that aside, I think people will digest it as long as they see clearly that there's also a significant positive action on the ground. Correct. And what better time than now when you've got such Absolutely. a strong mandate? Decision-making yeah. isn't a problem. It isn't. The coalition politics doesn't kick in. So perhaps uh, no better time than now to take some of those Correct. tough decisions. But again, the concern here is it's a very, very uh, industry view. And what about the Aam Aadmi out there, as we always say? Yes, what about people who are expecting uh, yes. that some of those entitlements will continue? At least the social sector schemes, do you see them pruning those considerably? I think, I don't think the, my understanding is that I don't expect them to prune social sector schemes. What I think their focus will be on bringing in efficiencies and making sure that money is put to good use. Uh, for example, whether it's a Narega or whether it's any other scheme, I think they will come up with plans to make sure that if you're going to spend, uh, say, 300 to 400,000 crores on these, all these programs, 
how to get the best out of it, which will also help kickstart the economy and also, you know, move to a, a situation of empowerment. So continue the schemes, but tweak them to make sure that they are more effective. Perhaps that should be the larger message. But of course, as we said, plenty of expectations uh, from Mr. Arun Jaitley as he presents the budget on the 10th of July. It is going to be a critical document, a critical policy statement of the government's intent and what it needs to do to ensure that India is back on the high growth path. With that, it's a wrap here on Budget Adda. We'll be back with more series and more focus uh, on different sectors, on what we can expect on the budget. Thanks so much for watching. Goodbye.